there are a lot of misconceptions about vitamin D. One of them being that there's actually, one of them being that is that there's only one form, this form that gets measured in the blood when you get a blood test for vitamin D levels by your doctor. And that can't be further, the, further from the truth. Um, there are some savvy clinicians who also test what would be considered to be another form that they call the active form of vitamin D, and that the comparison between the, the typical blood test, which tests for one, uh, what's called, what most practitioners would call the storage form of vitamin D, compared to the active form and that ratio, that, that that will tell you something about one's vitamin D status. That's also incorrect. You can potentially infer something from these numbers. I am going to go into that in this video. However, I need to be I need to be blatantly clear that there are literally dozens upon dozens of variations of vitamin D, meaning it's not just one molecule. That's why simply supplementing with a D3 supplement and assuming that the body will get all of the different variations of it, that is very myopic and that's not what happens. So first and foremost, let me just go through a general, a very, very general um, education about vitamin D synthesis. So in our skin, we've got cholesterol. And um, essentially, uh, there's a version of cholesterol. I'm not even going to give you the name because I don't want to get bogged down by, by the different names because they can be a little bit complex. But there's a version of cholesterol in the skin. And that version of cholesterol, when ultraviolet B light strikes that cholesterol, it converts that cholesterol into what's called pre-vitamin D3. And that pre-vitamin D3 can become dozens of metabolites of vitamin D. It can become every variation of vitamin D you can name, including ones that provide a major anti-cancer um, benefit that, again, that you cannot get through supplementation. So when you supplement with that D3 form, it can become, uh, let's say you supplement it with, it can become a couple of these metabolites, but it cannot become the dozens of metabolites of vitamin D that we just know of there's potentially many more in the body. You know, we were just kind of at the tip of the iceberg with this, in my opinion. And so that's largely why high dose vitamin D supplementation in certain populations, including as a cancer prevention, has not panned out to, to provide anti-cancer benefits. Whereas sunlight exposure does correlate to re reductions in things like number one, all cause mortality, but um, various cancers such as breast cancer, prostate cancer, um, uh, uh, colon cancer, right? And so it's likely there's more than just the vitamin D story. And I, in fact, I know that more than vitamin D is at play with sunlight exposure, but, let, but when they track vitamin D levels in response to sunlight, and they show that elevated serum levels of certain forms of vitamin D have an anti-cancer uh, uh, pro protective effect. And it's from the sunlight because the sun not only makes that version of vitamin D that they're measuring in the blood, it actually makes the dozens of metabolites, including a big significant chunk of them, which have proven anti-cancer benefits. So let me break this down a little bit more for you because I don't want this to be confusing, but I need you to know Bottom line is there's not one metabolite of vitamin D, but what gets tested in the blood is a store, what's called the storage form of vitamin D. And that is considered a quote unquote fat soluble vitamin, meaning if, it, if it's in the blood, it has to be transported on little, little rafts, right? Little rafts, because fat doesn't go freely through the blood. The blood is water. And remember, oil and water don't mix. And so it has to be kind of encapsulated in a little transport raft. And you can measure the amount of that form of vitamin D in the blood. And that's called 25 OHD. The name's a lot longer than that. We're going to abbreviate it but that 25 OHD is considered the storage form. And so doctors have said, okay, look, I'm, I'm, I have a population of people who are diabetic, or I've got a population of people who have autoimmune disease, or a population of people with cancer, or uh, GI, GI diseases. And so the doctors are then, um, you know, within the past decade, maybe two, because I remember asking my doctor before I knew a lot about vitamin D, I remember asking my doctor about 20 years ago for a vitamin D test. And she looked at me like I had three eyes and kicked me out for practice. <laughs> Um, so I asked too many questions even then. Um, so anyways, um, so now doctors probably within the past 10 years, it's not unusual to test that storage form of D because a lot of research has come out to say, oh, look, when we test this diabetic population, their, uh, 25 OHD is low. Okay. Look, when we test this autoimmune population, their 25 OHD is low. 
uh, look, when we, when we test people who have this inflammatory condition, their 25 OHD is low, but what they're doing is mistakenly uh, using the association between causation and actually, and so essentially it's a, it's a mistaken case of they're saying that low vitamin D is the cause of these conditions. And because low vitamin D is the cause, is what they're mistakenly saying is the cause of these conditions, then we must supplement high doses of vitamin D for people. And then all of a sudden we should be able to quote unquote heal or at least support the healing of these conditions. And that again, doesn't pan out. So what a lot of what, what savvier researchers, including independent researchers like Jim Stevenson Jr. are doing, um, so he's an independent world expert in vitamin D in so many ways, right? Like mind blowing expert. And what he has shown is that vitamin D, and I highly encourage if you're interested in this, dive into his substack. Um, but vitamin D, what he's showing is that yes, it's low, but it's low because it's a marker of inflammation, right? So we have other markers of inflammation in the body. You could test HSCRP, you could test homocysteine, you could test something called ESR or SED rate, right? So there's markers that we can test in the blood to assess where the body is at in terms of total inflammatory burden. And it turns out that low vitamin D is simply a marker of elevated inflammation, not the cause of the disease itself. And so this, like I said, the savvier clinicians were saying, okay, well, let me test and see the quote unquote active form of vitamin D. So research has also found that there's one particular version of vitamin D that does tend to elevate when there's inflammation. And sure enough, the storage form is low, the active form gets high because if there's inflammation and we, and we need to upregulate various anti-inflammatory pathways, which vitamin D can help with, likely the quote unquote active form will be elevated but it's not as simple as supplementing D3, elevating it and having a curative result. It doesn't work that way. It hasn't panned out that way. And so um, what it turns out through really diving into the, uh, into the research and again, highlighting Jim Stevenson's work is that you'll, the, the body houses vitamin D literally in every cell of the body. The body houses metabolites of vitamin D all throughout the body. It's not just this fat soluble vitamin that we've heard. It actually comes in a water soluble form that never gets tested. And so testing one vitamin D marker, making seeing it low consistently across diseased populations and assuming that if we artificially elevate it through supplementation, that will help, that again, that hasn't panned out. And so that is why I'm a huge, I'm not a fan of supplementing vitamin D3. There will, there may be a short instance of when I am a fan. I'm going to talk about that in a future video, but in general, I'm not a fan of long-term vitamin D3 supplementation. If you get it from a whole foods form, let's say liver or uh, cod liver oil, or I've had clients eat just canned cod liver but occasionally, right? Like not all the time, but if you feel like you need a supplement to supplement it in some capacity, it has to be done in its whole foods form because with that vitamin D comes the other co-nutrients that are needed for that vitamin D to be utilized effectively in the body, including vitamin A, which is a key component here in this. So vitamin D, vitamin A from whole foods, I can see, I can see how that can be a quote unquote supplemental benefit to have nutritionally just because of all the nutrients that things like liver or cod liver have. Um, but if you're talking about getting the most benefit from vitamin D in the body, it has to be through appropriate sunlight exposure because that sunlight exposure makes, again, all the metabolites and it makes now that can be fat, both fat soluble and water soluble. And all of those metabolites can get housed in every cell in the body. And so when we see that vitamin, that the blood level of vitamin D is low in the winter, it's not because the body is stupid and we need to artificially elevate the vitamin D. It's a metabolic switch in the winter that takes place. And, we, and we're just testing that one marker. Perhaps actually the water soluble version is more active. Or what I uh, truly believe is that in the winter, we use melatonin in place of vitamin D because we can make more melatonin in the winter, that pineal melatonin. And both of those can work hand in hand. Essentially, vitamin D is a marker of summer. Melatonin is a marker of winter. But I'm also going to talk about how we make a lot of melatonin in the summer as well if we are exposed to the correct light. So anyways... 
Suffice to say, it is a very incomplete picture to just test one storage form of vitamin D and draw any conclusions whatsoever. And it's still an incomplete picture to test the storage form and the active form. If you do get that test and you find that both that store, storage is low and active is high, it is simply a marker in my clinical experience of inflammatory cascades that are taking place. And so either the clinician or you as, you know, your own, essentially your own patient or your own client has to do the detective work to say, where is this inflammation happening in my body? And how can I tend to that inflammatory cascade so that my body is no longer um, showing that mar those markers of inflammation? And for me, that's just the basic quantum health strategies. That's things like earthing regularly. Remember, earthing sucks electrons into the body, sucks charge into the body, and that charge can go to calm inflammatory cascades. That's getting sunlight on the skin to build exclusion zone water. That exclusion zone water can donate charge also to calm inflammatory cascades. That's supplementing with something like molecular hydrogen, which our body can make when we get sunlight on the skin. Our gut microbiome is designed to make it for us, but we can also supplement it and it can act as a selective antioxidant to calm aggressive oxidative stress. And so again, it's not about vitamin D, uh, actually supplementing vitamin D to calm the inflammation. It's about getting, doing the, the quantum health strategies that we know that are just basic lifestyle strategies to help calm the, the inflammatory cascade that is being revealed with a low vitamin D blood marker. So I hope that makes sense, right? I'm not a fan of even testing vitamin D in the blood anymore, simply because it doesn't tell a complete picture. I liken it to testing thyroid. Remember back in the day, they would test your TSH and they would tell you about your whole entire thyroid function based on that one marker. And now we know it's not just TSH, but we could test TRH, TSH, free T3, free T4, um, thyroid antibodies, reverse T3. Like there's multiple biomarkers that we can assess when it comes to getting a com more complete picture about thyroid health. We that I think we're far away from that when it comes to actually testing for vitamin D. So that's why I don't test. And instead, I encourage people to get appropriate sunlight exposure so their body can naturally make vitamin D. There's a nutrient that we will need to do that. I'm going to talk all about this more in an upcoming webinar that, I, that I'm sure is going to be um, linked in the bio or in the description below this video. But there's, there, there are certain nutrients, there's certain sunlight exposures that we need, and there's certain nutrients that we need. And when we get those together, the correct nutrients and the correct sunlight exposure in the correct amounts and the correct timing, our body will naturally make a ton of endogenous vitamin D and all of the metabolites. And we don't have to obsess over one little blood marker that is simply potentially a marker of just an active inflammatory cascade happening in the body. So if you're interested in learning more, check out this webinar that's coming up. Um, but you know, again, I hope this gives you some peace of, of mind when it comes to you test one marker and it's low. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't give you a complete picture. And in fact, the, the innate intelligence of the human body allows your body to make all of the vitamin D in balanced amounts if you get it through sunlight exposure.